Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Next Gen Planners podcast. My name is Amelia Hamilton, and I am the head of community here at Next Gen Planners. Uh, and in today's show, I'm very excited um, about our guest because we are joined by the brilliant ADHD life coach, Kira Rosenthal. Welcome. How are you doing? I'm doing well, and I'm happy to be here. Hi to everybody. <laughs> it's a pleasure to have you. Um, so what we like to do on the podcast, just to um, give everyone a bit of an idea of what your day-to-day -day life might look like, um, is just to just to go today, last week, next week, what's a, what's a general, as general as possible, uh, day in the life of Yira look like? Well, I have two kids, uh, school-age right. children, so um, it entails getting up uh, around 6.30, getting them up and ready to leave the house, um, and then returning home to walk the dog, uh, and I do my meditation, my journaling. Um, I sit down to at my computer to um, do some research, uh, get some work done, get back to people. Um, I have uh, networking meetings throughout the day. It's really like a five hour window before I then have to go and leave to go pick up my my kids from school and, you know, uh, dinner and <laughs> all the stuff you have to do homework and getting them ready for bed. So, yeah, busy, busy, busy. Go, go, busy, go. Busy. Morning yeah. till night. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. And so as I kind of mentioned in the in the um, introduction that you're an ADHD life coach which is an interesting um kind of profession to go down so what made you decide that that was something that you wanted to do uh quite frankly during the pandemic um all of the because i used to commute to work um and my kids were in school all day the pandemic comes along and we all have to be at home and um all of the supports and the scaffolding that i wasn't aware of for myself disappeared. That meant that I had to figure out how to help my kids with their school work online, plus get my own work done. And that was a complete and utter failure. Um, but what I really saw was um, how ADHD was impacting, not just myself, but I had already had my diagnosis by this point, but how it was impacting my ability to function you know, in my role. Um, and I left my job and I decided I'm going to just work on family and figuring this thing out, which is what I did. And I started going to um, uh, parent uh, support meetings online, like for ADHD and uh, adult ADHD support group meetings. And I saw, um, I saw a community there that, uh, you know, in, in some ways, I, I felt like I understood a lot and I could help. And it really made me interested in learning more. And I finally went and got my, um, I, I registered myself to go to the ADD Coaching Academy. And I, been, I went through the program and I really felt like um, working with clients, I, I I, I could see how I could be making an impact and not just for for individuals out there, but really for my own kids, my own mm -hmm. family, just trying to figure out how I can show up the best for them and for myself and realizing yeah. that this is something that really impacts families generationally, you know, and we need to we need to get to it. <laughs> We need to understand Definitely. it, break it down, and, and make it easier for consumption. For sure. I mean, that sounds sounds like a, a, a an amazing aim, and, and you found that it's uh, been a helpful journey. What what does what are the main differences in your life now compared to um, you know before you kind of embarked on this on this mm -hmm. mission? Self acceptance, self awareness, um, advocacy. Mm. Uh, learning how to, um, you know, for example, with my kids and being able to communicate with their uh, schools on 
you know, how to best support them, you know, because they have learning challenges and how, and how can I work with the schools to best um, uh, communicate what their needs are and what new strategies they may not know about that they could implement. And not just to benefit my child, but to benefit everybody in the classroom. And the biggest, most important thing is mindfulness. I think just um, my dog is, <laughs> you might hear my dog in the background. She's, she's a little whimpering, but. That's, that's okay. Not... We, we love it. We love a dog. We love a dog with an action podcast. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think I answered. Yeah, that. definitely. I mean, I, and I think these are things that perhaps don't feel as important in the very, in the everyday kind of life that we all get swept up in until you actually do put the time and the work and, and effort into that and you realize how much difference and how important these things really are and the very palpable uh, kind of impact uh, mm -hmm. those it can have on yeah. on yeah as you said on on your kids life and on on your own life and ability to kind of um excel in the way and and fulfill your your potential in in a manner that is is not stressful and um heavy and you can you can kind of be just more authentically yourself and and understand how to do that in in a in a in a better way exactly you said it perfectly to you know showing up authentically um and i think for a lot of people in our community, it's um, uh, the self-acceptance piece, the, uh, the, the understanding how it impacts you on an individual level and having compassion for yourself, right? So that mm -hmm. you can say, it's not that I'm lazy or it's not this, it's not that, this is a real thing. And my environment, where if you go to a job, is it set up so that I can be my best? So that I can show up at my best, or do I have to go in and deal with an environment that's kind of hostile to my way of learning and to my way of being, you know, productive? Am I having For to sure. deal with a lot of distractions because I'm not, <laughs> you know, yeah, you know, my 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 workspace is not set up for me, you know, to be able to focus and concentrate. What you know, let's, yeah, that's the kind of thing that um, I think is really important for us. And to empower us. Yeah. And empower our sure. children and empower the next generation to speak up and say, okay, how can we make things better? How can we? And you know what? Ultimately, when we do that, it actually helps everybody. It's not just the neurodivergence who benefit, mm. the non neurodivergence benefit too. They just don't realize it. Yes. And this is kind of something that we've um, mentioned a few times now in this, um, in our Neurodiversity November content is that, yes, you know, we're, we're focusing on how can we be more inclusive? How can we create um, diversity of thought? How can we make sure that we've got a profession um, and an environment that, that is really fostering um, conversations that is, is going to be uh beneficial to these individuals and making sure we're not losing out but actually we we're making it in more inclusive for everybody because even if you're not neurodivergent you're still got a unique brain you've still got a unique way of approaching a situation and and your emotions you will react differently and so if we can really understand and value the individual for what they are and and how they work and empower them to work in a way that is um best for them it, it's everybody, isn't it? it? It's creating this environment that's that's beneficial to all, and there really is no downside. Um, in in my head, anyway, I think I think it's a bit of a no brainer. Well, I agree with you. <laughs> well said. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so our community um is a community of financial planners, um, and so I'd like to kind of move the conversation on to look at um these kind of uh the the kind of topics that might. Um, impact uh, our clients as financial planners because with ADHD the way that uh, people might react uh, to finances and their financial life um, and decision making processes can be slightly different to a neurotypical person um, so my first kind of question to you is how does ADHD 
uh, yeah, impact an individual's uh, perception and behavior towards money? Well, I think the first thing is um, we need to look at uh, how our um, childhood, how our parents, how the adults in our lives managed money and what that, how that can trickle down to us because it does, it does filter, right? How, if, you know, if you had, didn't grow up with, with very much, you might, you know, approach money from a place of lack or you may approach it from a place of, of, of abundance. Um, and how does that affect you? How does that affect the way that you decide, you know, where you will spend your money, what you will invest in? Um, and the thing with, with, uh, with us is, you know, we may have, um, you know, depending on where you are in your life, but if you don't feel like you have a successful, um, how do you define success? But if you don't have like a, 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 a successful pattern with money by the time you become an adult, that it, it affects your, it, your self-esteem, right? So you might be looking at, uh, you know, your history with money. Um, how does it influence the way you see yourself? You may have, um, you know, there may be issues with procrastination and like uh, starting a bank, like a, if you're thinking, oh, I just have to open up a bank account, you know, in your, <laughs> it's getting it done, making sure that you're moving it from your head and onto the piece of paper and then from the paper onto like manifesting in real life, right? Like mm -hmm. you have to break it down and do those baby steps. There's like procrastination, there may be that low self-esteem, um, impulsivity, you know, uh, thinking, oh, I, I did a great job today. I really should reward myself. <laughs> you know, how, what does that look like for you? Does it look like a financial, um, like you're, you know, are you buying yourself a trinket and, you know, how much are you spending? And is that within your, are you able to look at your, your budget and say, this is with, this falls within what I can afford for myself. And I think being able to, um, if it's if it doesn't, just being able to say, okay, not now. <laughs> I think that's hard for a lot yeah. of us. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if we think that we deserve it. <laughs> like I deserve yeah. that. I deserve that purse. Yeah. Um, Who doesn't call deserve me. a nice purse if you've done a good day's work? Yeah. If you finally focus, then yeah. <laughs> but so, yeah it's but tricky. I'm being I'm exaggerating a bit, but it's yeah. um but it's it's that impulsivity watching that. Mm -hmm. and um, checking ourselves and being more self-aware uh, an organization. I think that when it comes to, um, for, for ADDers especially, we, who may struggle more with like organizational things and being able to sort of organize your budget, it may not feel like a fun thing to do, especially if you don't feel like you have a lot of money or maybe yeah. you don't have a job and you think, well, how can I sit down and, and, figure this out interesting yes yeah. so there's so there's a lot of things that uh if your your brain is a adhd brain um there's a lot of kind of factors that might contribute to um decision making with money that is not conducive to necessarily healthy behaviors or um you know the the, the if we want to um be sensible quote unquote is our finances so if you are a financial planner then um are there any kind of considerations that you uh, would want to take when working with a client that you know um has adhd or or you kind of sense that that they have some of those similar behaviors um how how would uh, you advise someone to kind of um approach that and are there any strategies that that might be useful uh, well, I think the first thing you have to appreciate is that that individual, um, if they're coming to you, it's because they have decided for themselves that they are ready to take on that step. I don't think financial planners just knock on people's doors. You usually yeah. have to go out and seek them out. So already that person is showing, um, uh, you know, the ability to sort of focus and plan. I believe. You know, you have to be able to um, 
see that 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 person is able to make decisions for themselves and to take action on those things. And uh, asking them, what what is your goal? And sometimes helping them define what that is. If they don't know, if they if they're not coming to you knowing what that is, um, I think helping them, you know, identify what the financial goals are and how they can realistically, you know, um, try to meet them and in what ways you can partner. It should always be a partnership, right? It's never telling the individual, this is what you should do, this is what you should do, what that's do. Like trust that that person, um, they do know. There's, it's The answer lies within them and helping draw that from them, I think is important because ultimately that's gonna hopefully be a long-time client, long-time client for you who feels empowered, to make decisions for themselves, um, feels like they have a partnership, somebody who's there to say, you know, to kind of sort of, you know, be a guide. Um, you, you know, you're not a parent, <laughs> you're not a school teacher or anything like that. Um, and really in trusting that through education and taking your time, allowing that person to take their time because um, it can be overwhelming. And what's really important is to break it down. I can't like emphasize that enough. It's just being able to break down the steps to sort of financial freedom one step at a time. And it might seem, and I, you know, I think of my own children, right? When you're doing the scaffolding piece, it's um, just making it really easy for them until, you know, eventually over time, you'll see that they don't need so many of the scaffoldings anymore because it becomes more of a routine. But being prepared to, um, you know, I think walk them through that and, and, and trusting, trusting that, uh, trusting the client to do the work and to know what it is that they want. Yeah, and again, you know, kind of going back to the, the points that we were talking about earlier, that kind of strategy of making sure that you're really listening and understanding what that is, that's going to help everybody. If you're approaching um, clients and, and, you know, the strategies that you might use subsequently might be different, but that initial kind of really sitting there understanding, okay, who is this person? What do they need? What do they find difficult? What, um, where can I be of use? Where, you know, what have they got it? And it's absolutely fine. Um, and 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 taking the time to 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 understand who's sitting in front of you is sure going to be beneficial to clients who have ADHD, but it's going to be beneficial to everybody, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So I, it's it's um I think there's some really really good tips there um for for people um you know going going into to meetings with with clients who might have diagnosed ADHD or perhaps undiagnosed because as we know waiting lists for um for assessments over in the UK as well is very very long um and you know there's lots of people who might not think that they have ADHD but you know exhibit a lot of these behaviors as well so walking into these situations with an open mind and making sure you understand the person sat in front of you I think is um is is a brilliant brilliant uh Bit, mm -hmm. bit of advice there um so I think an looking, honest oh, I'm sorry, sorry but just an honest you know helping that client sort of have an honest compassionate mm. look at their financial history because I think there yeah. should be a lot of guilt associated if you don't have the financial um means that you wish you had now or hope that you would have I don't know at what point they are coming into you know, your life, they could be a 50 year old, it could be a 30 year old, it could be a 20 year old, you know, <laughs> um, if it's a 50 year old, they're coming with a lot of baggage. But still, yeah. you know, what is and looking at it compassionately, that's so important. So that that person can feel like, okay, I, you know, you may have made mistakes, but we, we are still in a place where right now, this present moment, this is the place where you can really start to take hold and take charge of where you want to go 
and just really Definitely. helping them lift that weight, whatever it is mm. that they had going on in their head, whatever story they were telling themselves about what it me, like how I deal with money. Like we need yeah. to, I don't know if this is a financial advisor's position, but it's something to keep in the back of their mind that we all have these narratives that we tell ourselves and they impact how we show up. Right. So what what are the what is the narrative that that individual has told themselves about how they manage money? Yeah, definitely. I mean, brilliant, brilliant uh, uh, tips there, I think, to, to walk into it. And like you said, you know, it's not your position to to fix anything or work through things, but but just to approach a situation compassionately and openly um, to make sure that you're building uh, trust and you're making sure that you can be as helpful to the individual as you possibly can be, um, which is the aim, I think, at the end yeah. of the day. Um, yeah. So so then bringing it back to kind of um, individuals, and we've had some really good chats with uh, members of our community, actually, who are neurodivergent um, themselves, and a lot of um, ADHD uh, uh, members of our community uh, too. Um, as someone who works in uh, a profession, you know, like financial planning, how can ADHD affect um, an individual's performance in their job? And yeah, what what, what challenges do you think in a, in a, in a working environment uh, people with ADHD have? Um, being able to, um, is the work that you're doing able, sustaining your attention? Do you find yourself getting distracted a lot, you know? And what do you do if that happens? <laughs> right? Mm. Um, I mentioned impulsivity before. Um, uh, and that, you know, that can come from, you know, whether how you respond in an email to a superior, right? Like, I, how do you do that? Um, uh, time management. Um, uh, we can have time blindness is a very real thing, <laughs> right? Uh, we can sometimes get so focused and excited about what we're doing that we forget about time and we forget that it's time to eat. <laughs> we mm. can forget that other people need to eat. <laughs> we can forget all kinds of things. So time, uh, just being um, aware of working within the time frame that you have allotted for yourself. That's something that I think individuals really have to, um, you know, kind of, through practice, figure out how they work best. Like, okay, I can work for 15 minutes straight, but after 15 minutes, my mind starts to wander a little bit. I might need to like get up and um, go to the use of bathroom or get a drink of water and just kind of come back to my desk. How do you, you know, how do you transition back into that, that place? I mean, the goal is to be self-aware enough that you know when you need that break. And sometimes I think with us, we, right. we can we can forget. Sometimes we overfocus, and sometimes we are distracted. Um, yeah. Organization. Uh, if you're working for an organi if you're working for an organization, um, sometimes you get uh, assignments from your boss or your superiors, and it's like, where is this on the priority, right? And being able to bring that up and advocate and say, well, right now. I may not be able to put that on my plate, but being able to sort of look at a calendar and say, okay, this is where, um, this is where I have room. And then being able to, to follow through with that and follow up with that. I think that those are things that can, that can come up for an individual. Um, yeah. Organization, time, impulsivity, your attention. I think these are things yeah. that an individual would want who may be on that um, sort of neurodivergent spectrum might want to be aware of. Sure, definitely. Um, and so if these are challenges that, and again, you know, everybody's different for, for one person who have ADHD, it might be more of one thing, less of another. Uh, and, and I understand we're talking more kind of in general terms and I'm sure right. in your work and part of your work is to understand, okay, where, whereabouts do you find things really difficult? What do you find things um, where do you find things slightly easier? Like, how can we, um, yeah, yeah, sorry, I'm you sorry. go. Uh, oh, no, that's okay. I just thought you... 
Actually, I think it, it's. I said what I, I mean. Keep going. Yeah, you can keep sure. going. Sure. Of course. Um, so, if we're now understanding, um, you know, some of the some of the more general challenges that uh, an individual might face, such as you know that time management, the organization, prior, prioritizing things, um, making sure that you're you're working to a deadline, making sure you're not getting distracted. Are there any, you know, are there any kind of techniques or strategies that you think might be helpful for an individual who has ADHD in that kind of setting? Are there, is there a, a, a kind of tip or a, a trick that uh, that you could, you could um, share? So everybody's different and everybody has um, uh, different ways that they learn or different ways that they need to work. So for example, um, some people really feel comfortable with having a piece of paper and a pen in front of them, a certain kind of pen, it has to have a certain weight to it. Uh, knowing that about yourself, do you are you a visual learner? Like what kind of learner are you, right? Um, do you, you know, do you need music? Do you, what what is gonna help you to focus? Are you somebody who needs to, like you put on your headphones and you can just put on that kind of music that'll help you to focus. Um, uh, I think knowing what kind of, uh, how you learn best and setting up your environment for that. Do you need sunlight? That's a big, <laughs> sometimes that's huge. And being able to set yeah. yourself up at that, that way. I think other than knowing what your, um, what you look like as a learner, are you an audio learner are you, uh, mm -hmm. that you need to hear things and read it? Some people need to hear something and see it in front of them. Some people need to write it down as they go. Like, and being, and giving yourself permission to do that. I think that's a, I, for myself, I know that was a huge thing is giving myself permission to do those things and not feeling awkward if somebody else thinks it's weird that, you know, I, guess yeah. I have crayons at my desk because it helps me to be creative and I like color. Yeah. <laughs> like color makes me happy and it helps me to focus and it helps me to get certain things done and it helps bring the creativity out in me more. Knowing that about yourself. I think other things, practical things as well that you can do is um, having a calendar, uh, writing things down in a place where you you will know where to find them and you know where to, you know, check for those things um, so that you can keep track of everything and being able to sort of, you know, every day um, train yourself to look at it and say, okay, what got done, what needs to get done, and then moving it on to the next day or to whenever so that you can continue to plug away at things that you need to do. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. And and it's it's all kind of, you know, rooted in that self-understanding, self-acceptance and, and compassion. And so instead of kind of approaching a situation of, well, you can't do this, you should do it like this. Why can't you do it like this? Go, I just need some crayons. Just just have some crayons on your desk. And, and, and if that helps, great. You know, there's no reason you should need to have black pen and, and paper or, or type everything and, and that's it and and if you need your brain to work in a different way if you need some sunlight then that's that's these are all you know fine things and, and approaching that conversation like you said with understanding first rather than um you know any kind of negativity or judgment um is is going to be the the best way forward right so then looking at um, zooming out even further then, so looking at um, kind of businesses and firms as a whole, how do you think um, companies could create more ADHD friendly work environments? And, and how do you think um, from, from that kind of senior level, what could people do to support um, employees to, and, and improve productivity? That's a good question and one that I constantly um, think about, especially when I'm working with clients who are work who are going into an office. It is not. Um, I think that if the company 
has a, has had a lens shift already, meaning that, you know, looking at neurodivergent as a problem or looking at people who are neurodivergent as a niche that we have to like accommodate. Like, why do we have to look at, why do we have to give this person that? Like you have, people need to stop thinking like that. That's the lens shift. Thinking that we are just trying to get over, right? There's a lot of like, oh, they're just, you know, being lazy. Why can't they do it like everybody else does? That lens shift has to, I think, happen first um, in these companies in order for, 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 you know, that whole HR mentality, I think, has to shift big time. It doesn't sound like the best. I don't think that's <laughs> even to me. It's just like, well, how do we do that? Do we have more podcasts like this? Do we have more, yeah. um, you know, uh, 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 conversations at the con uh, at a, you know, I know they go to retreats and stuff, and or yeah. in, on, on the on the people who are on the board of these companies who can, you know, speak about their um you know their neurodivergent lens right and because we all you you must know someone you must have children or you must have nephews or nieces you must have cousins you must have siblings who are challenged in or I don't want to say challenged but who you know who's who's um you know way of being it poses a challenge to society. Yeah. I don't want to say that we're the challenge. <laughs> yeah. Um, challenged by the environment right. that is made for different people. And, and it's, Thank you. you know, yeah. Right. I think it's, it, it's interesting even um, to kind of take a slight tangent on, on that um, kind of conversation is looking at, you know, um, Linda, who was on the podcast last week, made a good uh, analogy there that I, I think is useful to raise again. That you know, if suddenly everyone at work was told you can't wear your glasses anymore, so there's going to be some people that find it harder to look at the screen. To to they're going to be exhausted by the end of the day because they're having to strain their eyes. They're having to work harder. It's not that there's nothing to do with them. It's just they need some slight accommodations to the environment in order. To, to allow them to work in the same way as everybody else and if we can try and think that. of neurodivergent people in a similar way that it's it's nothing to do with what they they can't do there's just something needed in order to um allow them to work in the most productive way and and fulfill their potential i love that that's a great so I'll let, i yeah, I can't. I'm. I, I just want a slight tangent. You probably have forgotten what no, you, but you were saying it now. But it, it breaks it down, and it it gets it's direct, and it gets to the to I think the sense of what I'm trying to say. Yeah, absolutely. So it's really understanding. Um, it's not. Uh, you know why? Why do we have to do extra things for this person? Extra things for that person? And really, we take a step back, and it's just looking at individuals valuing them for who they are and seeing how can we um you know implement some uh, support that will enable our workforce to be the most productive it possibly can be and you know and, and that can be driven by selfish means rather than compassionate ones really because inevitably it's going to end up being a more a positive successful happy workplace where you're going to have a higher retention of staff and you're going to have higher productivity. Oh, absolutely. So, higher retention, yeah. higher productivity. That's what they want, right? <laughs> yeah. That's um, so I mean we've kind of we've kind of started answering the the, the next uh, question then. And that is, you know, how can businesses benefit from embracing neurodiversity? And and how can you leverage leverage those kind of unique strengths that someone with ADHD brings because this is the the whole conversation of you know diversity and often neurodiversity is left out of the conversation of diversity um and diversity and inclusion why should we make sure that uh people who are neurodivergent are included in the conversation about diversity and and why 
do, can business benefit from that? Uh, that's a great one. That's a great question. Um, you know, I think that we, our community, we bring so much to the table, so many different ways of looking at things that, you know, sometimes when companies have been doing something the same way over and over and over again, it's hard to see what needs to, what, what tweak it needs. And mm -hmm. it takes that neurodivergent mind to come in and say, oh, well, this is what you could do with that. Because, you know, this is the little invention I created and it's helped me and it's helped everybody around. I mean, it takes that, you know, it takes that person to stand up and say, um, uh, you know, sometimes I think, it, and uh, um, bear with me, this might be one of those things you edit, <laughs> but I think about this with my with children, right, in schools. Um, and those kids who struggle a little bit more, right? Because they're just not caught up yet. Their brains are still mm -hmm. cooking, right? Um, and they are in some ways penalized and taken out of the room because they're not, you know, they're not able to function the way the other kids are. And the teacher is not able to teach the way she wants to teach and whatever. They're not able to meet the numbers that they want to meet. But when you take that child out of that room, the child, the, their behavior is really showing you that there's something missing. There's something in the curricula, in the environment, in the way that it is expressed that is not working. And if something isn't working, let's pay attention and see how, can, don't take the child out. Don't take the person out. Let's see what can we fix in the, what, and I hate the word fix, but what can we, um, what is it in the environment that we can take a look at? And I think that that's what happens with, with, with people like us come into the room. Um, we're showing you something, something here is it. It's not that, you know, it could be the individual, but sometimes it's, if you have enough people reacting the same way, maybe there's something in the room mm. <laughs> that needs to change. Yeah. Right. Definitely. Um, yeah. So to say that, companies should be more uh, embracing of this neurodivergent population because oftentimes we can come in and quite naturally show you what it is that you need to tweak to make your company better, to make the product better. Yeah, definitely, for sure. And, you know, it's just having those different perspectives in in all, you know, walks of life. And, and if you have individuals who become financial planners who think in a different way, then, you know, they might suit some clients in a better way as well. And and so you suddenly have real kind of uh, uh, real positives about having a workforce that doesn't think in the same way, doesn't approach situations in the same way. And there's going to be people who are, you know, you've, we've got this client over there, you know, whoever isn't really you know meshing with them that well why don't we you know we've got we've got someone else who, who might be able to to be on their level even more that's a great point I wish I'd said that <laughs> it's just they're all great points well there's endless there's endless benefits and um, positives to to making sure that we have a as an inclusive uh, space as possible um and so I guess what are the barriers to creating that um that environment is sometimes a stigma that's associated with not just ADHD but neurodiversity as a whole um and there's a lot of misconceptions around what that might mean and I think you know the the general population hasn't perhaps caught up with um where people who are in the field of of um, working with neurodivergent people are in the sense of understanding what um real tools and and um brilliant assets they can they can bring with them so what do you think um people can do to kind of reduce that stigma associated with with ADHD and perhaps uh the negative view that that might be brought up in people's heads um There's a lot of, I think, nuance, right, that has to take place, mm -hmm. like on the uh, 
on, a, there's on, a, on some scale, we have to be more comfortable um, talking about mental health. And uh, yeah. um, uh, just, I think, being honest about it for ourselves um, so that we can be an example, I think, for others who may be struggling, you know. Um, it's a reality. You can't separate it. You can't separate it from an individual, whether they are raising children or commuting, you know, working as a nurse or a doctor, I mean, or, or you know, a business person, whatever it is, you, you're coming in with your, with your, your human makeup and all the things that affect mm -hmm. you. So we have to, I think, have honest dialogue about what taking care of your mental health looks like in in real time. You know, your boss may be somebody who you look up to, but they also may be dealing with some mental health issues that you don't know about. You know, um, how you know? Look at the people around you who are leading, who are um, an influence and ask yourself, what is it about them and how do they manage their mental health? You know, can we ask those questions about people and see, well, do you meditate? Do you walk? What do you do to bring yourself mm -hmm. to calm and peace in this world that is just like, it feels like it's blowing up. <laughs> you know, how do we, how do you take care of yourself? How did you show up for yourself today? Yeah, and I think bringing into the conversation mental health and neurodiversity it's hand in hand isn't it and and a lot of the conversations um in that i've been having is that you know there's some people who have un, undiagnosed adhd but they were diagnosed with anxiety or depression or, or whatever it was because they didn't understand you know how their brain worked and, and why they felt certain ways and so the the two are kind of inextricably linked aren't they we they they feed into one another and support on one side can often benefit the other because it's all to do with our brains and 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 how our brains are feeling and and um reacting to things and so i think it's really really important and i'm really glad that you brought kind of mental health and understanding mental health into this dialogue um because you know it's it is you know neurodiversity is a form of mental well-being and understanding uh your internal world and and making sure that you can show up for yourself and and um show up then for others in 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 the best way yes. yeah <laughs> brilliant so we've got uh two final questions then and these are questions that we like to ask everybody who is on the podcast uh and so the first question then is a book so we always like to ask our guests for a book that has helped them in their career so far so do you have a, a book in mind for us actually yes <laughs> this one's called <laughs> yes you can yes. talk about mental health at work by melissa doman um and because this is a topic that we were just talking about, but just I'm really interested in knowing how we can help organizations um, evolve when yeah. it comes to talking about mental health. And I love this book because um, it's just very affirming that it can be done and it can be done a certain way, that there is a place for it. So amazing what an, an excellent segue as well so well done for for leading that straight in there um and so the final question then is perhaps an unfair question uh for you but i'm going to ask it anyway and see and see what we get uh and that is final question what are you most excited to see in the world of finance in the next 10 years i am waiting with bated breath to see what comes out <laughs> because yeah. i don't know <laughs> Um, it just seems, you know, I think that maybe this is an ADHD thing and, 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 you know, I was talking about the narratives that we, we tell ourselves, um, uh, I, I can't even think beyond, you know, this, this yeah, year, right here. Yeah. Mean, 10 years, that's a hard thing for me to even to think of. So I don't have an answer for you, but I, like I said, I, I, I will sit here and, 
and watch and, and pay attention and take notes and amazing yeah and get on perfect board. great great answer i think most of uh, the financial services are, are waiting as well going what what's going to happen what are we going to do uh and uh yeah lots of unknowns in in the best possible way uh but for now then uh I will just say thank you so much for for joining me. Um, it's been a pleasure talking to you and, and understanding more about ADHD. So uh, thank you so much for your time. Amelia, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. It was nice talking to you. Brilliant. You too. So that was Yira Rosenthal on the Next Gen Planners podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can share it on all social media platforms and you can listen to past and future episodes on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts and on our website, which is nextgenplanners.co.uk. On our website, you can find loads more information about our brilliant community. And finally, if you can, do leave us a review. It helps to grow the podcast even more. Thank you very much.